Welcome to the show, Andrew. Glad we could finally get you in. Unfortunately, we're not in studio. We are quarantining here in California. How you doing? Pleasure to be here. Would have loved to see you in Joshua Tree and some other places, but uh, we'll make do. Yeah, we will definitely make that happen once we're out of our houses. And when we first met, I don't know if you remember this, but we had a pretty spirited discussion around technology and its impact on relationships. And Johnny and I tend to take a, I guess, a more negative view of technology and how it's impacting our social skills and our relationships and damaging our mental health. And you actually had a, a very positive outlook, and we'll, we'll talk about a business that you started as well around this exact thing. But now that we're in this quarantine and we're relying on technology more than ever to communicate, do you still believe that technology can connect us, bring us together, and, and help us communicate? Or have you swung a little bit more to my side and, and Johnny's side here, the dark side? I, I think that it all comes down to intentionality. I think that what we're going to find very, very quickly is, again, just because we are on these tools and I can see your eyes and I can hear your voice does not mean that we, we feel connected or we're exchanging anything that's of value to either of us. And so, so much of my, my work in the realm of communication comes down to intentionality. Is what is my purpose for being here? How do I want to show up? And so, you know, again, as we're, we're using these technologies more and more, if we are allowing the, the architects of our digital universe to dictate how we are using these things, putting the most beautiful images up top so we keep mindlessly scrolling, putting the features up there that are gonna zap our time and attention into things that aren't really valuable for us, then it's gonna be depleted. It's not gonna be rewarding for us. But if we become more conscious of these as tools and we're aware of how we want to use them, and they can certainly add value to our lives. You know, so many people talk about studies about increased Facebook, Instagram usage, and how that, that results in a, in a decrease in subjective well-being. But there's actually must, much less traffic studies that show that for people who interact on those, those social networks in a different way, if they're doing active browsing instead of passive browsing, then they actually show increases in their subjective well-being. And so just to make that more clear, active browsing is if you're actually on Instagram and you're commenting on people's posts. If you're even better messaging those people, then people actually show that those are positive experiences that improve their subjective well-being. But if you're just sitting there passively browsing, stalking, then it's obviously not going to do something positive for your well-being. And so I think that it's, it certainly can be, you know, a boon in many ways for humanity, but we have to be much more intentional about how we're using these things. Oh boy, we've opened up the can <laughs> of worms. So let's just go into this let's idea. Let's dive in. Active and as of active usage of social media. How do you see it being built to where people will hit the wall and go, there's a, there's a better usage for me and this technology? It's a great question. I think that, so the first part that I touched on was about personal responsibility. It was intentionality. How do I want to use these things? But I think that there's also a responsibility that lies on the end of, of like I use the word, the architects of our digital universe is the people who are creating these technologies. And I don't know if you guys have had them on the podcast, but Tristan Harris from the Center for Humane Tech, who's an incredible guy. And we were one of the first companies at Tribute that was listed on, on time well spent. But what they, what they point out is, again, is that the, the metrics that most technology companies are optimizing for are not aligned or correlated at all to the actual value that users are extracting from that experience. So an example of this, again, is let's just use Instagram. A lot of people have seen their Instagram uses jump up during COVID-19. So if you're a designer or a product manager at Instagram, the things that you are optimizing for is time on site, is sharing, it's return usage. So these are metrics about how much people are using their app. And if you were to ask the normal person, do I feel better or worse, depending on how much time I spent on Instagram, they'd say I feel better when I spend less time there. So you immediately have this conflict where the people who are designing these technologies are not aligned with the actual value that people are extracting with it. And so what, what there is, is there's a personal responsibility element of us coming into these things with intentionality and purpose for how we're using them, but also a call to creators and entrepreneurs of which I know there's so many who listen to the show to ask themselves, what are the KPIs that, that I am optimizing for that are allowing me to build a successful business, but are fundamentally and foundationally adding value into our end user's life. And it's why at Tribute, one of our favorite KPIs is, is 
TOJ, which stands for Tears of Joy, which literally means that we <laughs> ask people who have received the tribute video, did you cry tears of joy when you watch your video? And 80% of those people, we've given more than 500,000 of these videos, cried tears of joy. Like the, another question is, do you feel more connected to the people that you were involved in this video with? And at that point, it's 95% of people feel more connected in their important relationships. So it's like, how do we introduce this idea of human-centered design and key performance indicators that are actually indicative of the value that people are taking out of these apps? And to your point, the problem with the current design is they actually reward you for being passive and they block you and ban you for being active because active can lead to spam and some things that they don't want to see. So if I'm an active user who just loves giving out likes and comments and telling people how amazing and awesome they are, which helps me, and as we've talked about before, the person receiving it on the other end also feels good, all of a sudden Instagram or Facebook says, hey, stop. Like if you've ever tried to actively use the apps to that benefit, you hit a wall. They have a blocker. I think it's like 50 people on Instagram messaging 100 people on Facebook. So there is definitely a balance between your intent as the user, but also the designers making it easy for you to connect. And I know on Snapchat, one of the features that I really enjoyed was the idea of keeping a streak going, encouraging you to use the app to stay connected to people. So there are use cases where technology can be put intentionally to help humanity, but a lot of us find ourselves trapped by the downside of technology where it is hurting our mental health and it's making us feel less connected. And certainly in this period, a lot of us are struggling with feeling lonely, even though we have access to Zoom, even though we have FaceTime. And I know some friends who are sort of tapped out from being on Zoom and being on FaceTime because it's not a good representation of being in the room with someone and being able to sit in silence and being able to read their body language. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's the way that we interact on screens, right, is usually oftentimes through the lens of social networks. And so the image that we are portraying is the highlight reel, is that one that's manicured, that's got a filter on it. And as we're looking at each other here, as we're on Zoom calls and conference calls, that's not that. So there's this, again, this real kind of difference between what we're used to sharing in this kind of digital realm versus what we're looking at right now. It's why every time, every week I get together with a number of men for this, this online men's group. And the first thing that I say to the guys who come in there is I say, I want to remind you guys that you don't have to be any other way than exactly how you're feeling right now. If you're feeling exhausted and like shit and you just want to sit there, then do that. Like if you think someone here is full of shit, tell them. Like, and we have conduct of how you do that, but it's that it's a space of removing those expectations of them of like, sure, there's a code of conduct, how we operate, but you don't have to be any way. You can just be how you are in this space. And it makes a two hour conference call like much more energizing. There was something else that along with this, that I think all of us have to do a better job in recognizing, which is this is all new technology. And so once we realize, hey, the way we've designed these things is making people depressed and a little bit more disconnected, well, then there's a then we're gonna re uh, jigger our trajectory and 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 course correction to fix that. And people were standing there just going, getting mad, like, yo, well, you see these guys in Silicon Valley, they just want to go it this way, and they're just sucking us on when they don't care. When actually. You, and you yourself are with Tristan are working on these ideas of how do we course correct? How do we fix this? Uh, we went too far in this direction. And that's difficult for the average person to understand because the average person doesn't think like an entrepreneur. They don't, they are not looking to see which way things are going and course correcting and tweaking things. They want things to be I'm going this way. I'm going that way. I know what's over here and I know what's over here. When all of this technology is, this is, this is all brand new. Well, it's, it's again, it's like, if you look at, there's, there's a, a great deal of evidence to show that humanity exists in, in one of the most prolific and, and beautiful times that we've ever experienced. And at the same time, there are statistics that talk about, you know, increased suicide and deaths of despair and loneliness and some of these more kind of interpersonal uh, metrics of how we're living that are 
going down that are, are plummeting. And so how we measure our success as humanity is, is really interesting. Of like, There are some very fundamental things that have improved, maternal wellness, poverty decreasing, war going down, dictatorships, and that's amazing. And so I think that now we have advanced to a level where we can become more aware of these interpersonal things, like you know, am I happy, am I connected? And as we become aware of those problems, it's one of the simplest ways to, to tackle entrepreneurship, to enable anyone to contribute is because as those types of problems emerge, there's more opportunity for anyone, but you don't have to create a business. You can create a hangout. You can just create more depth or meaning in a Zoom call. You know, it's, it's just more accessible to, to solve a problem, add value. Yeah, creating that space for us to be intentional and be real and be vulnerable. And I think right now, the apps aren't necessarily doing a good job, but there are opportunities. And, and let's talk about Tribute a little bit more because I, I want to get into the core mission and how the idea came about. For yeah, you. man. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of smiling over here and I'm exhausted because my reality is that over the past two weeks, I have been putting in 16 hour days, seven days a week because our, our business Tribute, which I'll explain in a, business, in a moment, has more than 10 X and is growing by about 25% every single day. Um, and it's been nonstop and it's been a six year journey, but it's a pretty epic moment, man. We've, we've onboarded 25 people in the past two weeks and it's, it's crazy, but this all started six years ago on my 27th birthday when I went out for a very low key birthday dinner with my wife while well, she was my girlfriend, then Mickey, uh, now my wife and baby mama. And uh, we went out for dinner. I told her I didn't want to do anything special. I just want to come back and hang out with her. When we come back to my house, we, we get there and I, I open the door and I see like 30 pairs of shoes that I didn't recognize. And I was like, what's going on? And then she gives the countdown, three, two, one, and 20 of my closest friends all jump out and surprise me. And so it's this epic surprise party. And we're having a great time. And then halfway through the party, she gets everyone to our living room and she had rented this projector. And so she puts this this image up on the wall and I look at it and I'm like, what are you doing? And she's like, just wait. And she hits play on the projector. And what I didn't know is that my wife had reached out to 20 of my closest friends, uh, my family members, and she asked each of them to submit a one minute video telling me why they love me and how I've impacted their life. And so I get goosebumps telling the story. I've told it many times. And I was sitting in the back of the room and the first person is my mom. And she tells me how grateful she is that I helped her to start a business. And then it's my dad who, tells me that he loves me. And, and I know that he loves me, but he doesn't say those words a lot. And then the next person is, this is what took me over the edge, is uh, my friend, Matt, who told me, he said, you know, you're my best friend. And I was 27. I've been friends with him for three years. I, I knew that Matt was my best friend, but as an adult male, it can be challenging to, to say those words as an adult man to get a new best friend. But I got one and, and he vocalized that in that moment, I just lost it. And I was just in the back of the room, bawling my eyes out. And for 20 minutes, that was just what I was doing. I was crying because I felt so connected. I felt so loved. And I came out of that. I looked at Mickey and I was like, I think I just watched my eulogy at 27, which feels like a much better time to watch the eulogy. And I was like, how did you do this? And she says without hesitation, it sucked. And I was like, what do you mean? And she was like, well, I had to email these people hundreds and hundreds of times as collecting files through Dropbox and Drive. I'd edit everything together in iMovie. It took me like 15 hours. And I walk into the next room and I was like, this is the most meaningful gift I've ever received. It was terrible experience to create. And one of the most profound experiences of my entire life. And so what started is this idea to share this with the world, like share this with people, you know, has grown over the past six years to you know, now we, the New Yorker called us Hallmark 2.0 a couple of years ago. We've given more than 500,000 of these videos and Tribute is our video software that automates the process of inviting your friends, collecting videos. We automatically stitch them together. And as you can imagine, it's, we saw in late March, it's been just going kind of at a steady pace. It's been a fun lifestyle business for us. And then in March, every single day, I just started seeing it kind of like trickle up and I didn't even wow. think about it for a little while. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then it just started going truly exponential. And as you can imagine, it's like millions of gatherings being canceled from weddings to graduations. Two million kids or so are going to graduate this year who aren't going to get to walk across the stage or hear their commencement speaker. You think about like we have mothers who are on the site who are going in to give birth without their partners. You have funerals. People are, are being buried without the presence of their families. And so you know, we actually decided to, to make the site 
uh, free for people about two weeks ago as well of just that this is an opportunity. We created this and that you, certainly we want to make money, but also to step in in a time like this and say that just because we can't be with each other physically doesn't mean that we can't connect, that we can't celebrate each other. And so that's, that's tribute and, and really comes down to, again, the, the role of, of appreciation and gratitude in our relationships. It's like, it's one of the easiest things you can do to connect more deeply is to, if you have love in your heart, if you have appreciation for someone, if it's a coworker or a friend or a child, it's like, there's no reason to keep it inside. And this is like the value of technology is that you can create a context that makes it easier for people to express those things that maybe they've never said before. And once you've, you've let that out, you're more likely to get that kind of appreciation back. You're more likely to do it again. So it's this beautiful snowball effect. That's wonderful. It creates space for people who may not have the ability to say these things in person. They may not have the emotional fortitude to not break down and share these things with you, but they can do it over video. And the best part is that memory is stored in the video. It's not just you hearing it in person and, and putting it in your filing cabinet upstairs, but you actually have the video to remain. Whether it's at work, whether it's at hospitals, like there's so many use cases, again, where sharing our appreciation, I think, is one of the most foundational things that we can do, that we control to connect. And I think for a lot of us, we walk around feeling a little underappreciated because we are scared to be vulnerable, appreciate others. We don't get it back. There's a reciprocity tied to it. And we talk about this on the show quite a bit that, you know, it takes someone being the leader and stepping up and saying, you know what, I'm going to start appreciating people, strangers, friends. And it has that ripple effect where the other person feels good. You feel good for sharing that appreciation. It doesn't have to be selfish, but studies do show that when we express gratitude towards others and we share how deeply those people have moved us, we actually feel better internally about ourselves. We have higher self-esteem. It's, I mean, you, you are practicing gratitude, right? It's like if you look at the simplest thing that you can do to feel better, it's, it's establishing a gratitude practice. It's waking up in the morning. What am I grateful for? What am I looking forward to? And so it's when you tell people why you appreciate them, however simple that is, you are practicing gratitude. You are going to feel better. You know, in the workplace, people have shown that, that bosses who share appreciation openly are going to be more successful than bosses that do not. It's been shown to motivate performance of employees. And, and I think one thing that we talk about at Tribute as well is that, you know, there's a, there's, we, we call it, I love you because, and it's, I love you is a beautiful, very meaningful statement. You know, I could say um, that basically like Mickey, I love you and walk out the door and she'd feel that and she'd get it. But if I look at Mickey and I say, Mickey, I love you because you have been cheerleading me so hard this past week and you're taking care of hero while I'm like banging away at the computer and I just so appreciate how you've been showing up. It's that, that layer of because, the why of how you share your appreciation adds another layer of thoughtfulness to it that shows that you really mean it. And so if you just add that, that onto your experience or your expression of gratitude, it's a really powerful way to not only make it more deeply felt for them, but also for yourself. It's you become more aware of the appreciation that is, that is in you. Like even when I said that, she just walked in front of me with our son. And I was like, man, I'm so grateful for her right now. And speaking of Mickey, she on the show when she came to visit talked about this concept of social flow. And I know it's another big part of your mission going back to this intentionality for those of us who struggle socially, finding our flow, finding rhythm and, and feeling at times awkward, break down for our listeners what you mean by social flow and how we can achieve it. Yeah, absolutely. So social flow is a, a modality that, that I synthesized that I use at the beginning of all of my retreats. Anytime I'm, I'm hosting conversations, intentional gatherings, and just my, my modus operandi, which is just a, a simple framework that allows people to tap in, become present, trust their voice, and speak transparently wherever they are. And so in layman's terms, it's a, it's a practical framework to feel good, be yourself, and inspire people. And it's based off of this, this four-letter acronym, ICAN. And it stands for intentionality, curiosity, authenticity, now. Intentionality, curiosity, authenticity, now. And so, you know, I, I use that example of oftentimes I lead these men's retreats and I have this weekly town hall for men. And so when the men tap in, these are our 
communication expectations. And so intentionality, you can just think of that as how do I want to show up while I'm here? So while I show up and I look you guys in the face, I want to be super present. I want to be authentic. I want to be excited and, and energetic. So there, when I put my attention onto my intention, I, I manifest that energy in the moment, you know? And I think about my purpose, why I'm here. It's like, I want to share practical frameworks about how people can feel more confident, how they can connect deeply, how they can share their love more openly. So when I focus on those things that are intrinsic motivators before I go into a conversation, I'm already starting from a powerful place where like, here's what I'm here to do and what I'd like to accomplish that isn't necessarily focused on any sort of external validation. And that's, that's what you'll find through social flow is how do I exist with other people living from intrinsic motivation instead of seeking external validation? It's internal versus external. And so the next is you go into curiosity and curiosity is just, what do I want to know? So as I sit before anybody, it's if you can hone your curiosity like a muscle and just ask yourself, not what are the best questions to ask somebody, but whether it's before a big call or in a moment with someone, what do I want to know about this person? Truly, like what am I most curious to understand? And you give yourself to that authentic curiosity, you're going to have something of value to contribute in conversation. And in terms of how you're going to be received, you think about the last time someone asked you a genuine question to understand you, how did that feel? Fantastic. Feels yeah. good. It feels connected. Like they care, like they want to understand you. And so you get to give that. And so the next is, is authenticity, which within this modality I study called Gestalt, it's, it's just, what do I have to share? And it's like, what's on my mind that I have to share? What am I thinking about? What am I feeling? And the more that we get in touch with our present moment experience, feelings and thoughts and can give it a voice, we don't need to contort it masterfully and so it's just tapping in with what have I been thinking about what am I feeling and giving that a voice and then the last one is is now is that in any given moment uh, realizing as someone who, who dealt with shyness and social anxiety for so much of my early life and and still kind of like weaves its way into my life in funny ways you know as a 33 year old man um, now is just the reminder that Anytime I'm, I'm feeling anxiety for the most part with people, it's because I'm in a story about what the future holds or some story about who I am and how I'll be received. And if I am in the moment right here, if I'm tapped into my intrinsic motivation, just that there's, there's so much less anxiety there. And so it's a reminder to just come back to the present moment, to get out of stories of if I say this, if I ask a deep question, I'll make them uncomfortable. If I don't show up in a certain way, I'm going to make them feel weird. If we come out of those stories, if we come back into the present moment, it's again, you are grounded in intrinsic motivation, the present moment, and zapped out of that, that external validation seeking mindset that, that is the cause of so much you know, social discomfort. And you bring up curiosity as a muscle. And I know that for a lot of our clients, especially the analytical guys who come through our doors and work with us, they often struggle to express curiosity in others. They hold themselves in high regard. They judge themselves. They're perfectionists. And they're so focused on themselves to a degree that they really struggle with being openly curious outside of, you know, the core motivators for them. So career tends to be what they study deeply so they can go on and on about code. But when it comes to a normal social environment where, well, you're probably not going to interact with another engineer. You're probably not going to interact with someone who has such a deep level of understanding around certain subjects. How can we build that curiosity muscle if we don't find ourselves being that curious? Yeah, you know, I think it's a, it's a beautiful question. And, and I would start by asking yourself generally, if you're just to give yourself an idea, this is an exercise that anybody could do. I oftentimes talk about it as the big five at, at conferences. And so the big five, if I was just to say, when I meet somebody new, what am I thematically generally most interested to know about this person? So like, what, do you, what is your underlying curiosity? What do you really like to know about the people you meet? And so if you just ask yourself that question, you could write down the whole list of what do I want to know about them? And to make it more kind of practical, mine would be, what's your dream? Like, I, I want to know, like, what could people do if they could do anything? I want to know what's challenging right now. And challenge isn't bad, as we oftentimes, you know, put it in that bucket. Challenge just means that something is difficult for us in the moment. It's, it's very human. Um, outside of that, it's what are you most looking forward to? It's like, what have you learned recently? It's, these are the types of questions that I just 
want to know about most of the people that I meet because they speak to the essence of, of who they really are. And so the practice of that is and I did the, a whole training for a while where I would wake up every single morning. And what I would do is I would say, what do I want to know? What do I want to know about this day? It's what do I want to understand? If that was something about geopolitics, if that was something about what's Corona doing, if that was something about why I'm feeling the way that I do, about like why do I have ringing in my ear, like why do my wrist hurt? It's if you were just to, to tap into your curiosity and as an exercise, give it a voice, make it more real. What do I want to know? You're literally training your curiosity as a muscle to just be more aware of what it is that you want to know. So in the moment when you're with people, you're more aware, you're more capable of bringing that into conversation. So I love that tip. The The last question that I have that I want to bring up and unpack a little bit more, and I'm a member of one of the men's groups that you've organized, is this idea of men and our emotions and how we deal these with these emotions. And of course, right now, I think everyone is feeling a lot in terms of emotions, all the feels. And we're struggling at times with all the uncertainty. And I know that's a big part of the work that you do with your men's group. So what have you found in in your working with men in particular that holds them back from this emotional mastery and really understanding their emotions and communicating them? And what can we practically do to start tapping into that? Because so much of our experience is tied to our emotions and we should be able to communicate them. Yeah. And I mean, and, and who taught us how to experience and express our emotions? What does that even mean? Who, who knows? Who has an answer to that question? It's, it's again, it's kind of like our, our expectations of what emotionality looks like for a man, especially, is violent. You know, it's like it's anger. It's slamming a door. It's like crushing it on, on like some sports field. It's like that's the type of emotionality that we've been conditioned to express. It's like in women, it's, it's on the other end of the spectrum. It's the more sympathetic and crying and connected and, you know, all of these kind of pejorative like associations. And so like what I would say is the, the founder of Gestalt, this modality that, that I study, says that what we don't express, we suppress. What we don't express, we suppress. And that like our emotions are present in us, like all the, and just like if you were to think about like some of the core emotions of fear, shame, sadness, anger, joy, um, is that when we feel these things and we are not aware, present, or interested in connecting with them, in expressing them consciously, whether that's through word, whether that's through exercise, um, that those get stuffed down. And those emotions then imprint themselves on our actions and on our communication in subconscious ways. And that's snapping at someone because you were frustrated. That is getting angry, maybe slamming a door because you weren't able to actually address something. And so like why it's so important is that like until we're, we're more capable of connecting, being with our emotions, expressing them masterfully and productively, it's, they will, in a, in a really present way, just run, run our lives and imprint on how we show up in the world. And so it's so important for spaces to exist where not just men, but all people are liberated and, and supported in this practice of what we call emotional mastery, which is just really taking the time to, to check in. And if I were to say like, again, it's like, what do you feel in your body right now? Getting out of the head, getting into the body. You know, if I had a feeling in my, my stomach, like what's the emotion that's behind that? If that emotion had a voice, what would it be saying? How long has it been there? Do you, does it have a message for you? Do you have a message? It's, when we're, we're able to just be with our emotions, that experience in and of itself, we increase our capacity to be with them out in the world, in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think what happens so often is that we're never, we're never taught this again. And so what happens is not us are we expressing them in, in these unproductive ways, like anger, but a lot of times numbing you know, is just escaping these emotions, whether that's through substance abuse, whether that is through women and distractions, video games, like you name it. It's like, that is, you know, I think again, another issue that we face today is that people don't have the ability to, to feel their feelings, to sit with them. Um, and so they just numb out. And so, so much of the work that we want to do is just to create a space where people can just like we talked about before, be however you are, what's there and give them some simple tools that allow them to experience what's there, to express it. And that in and of itself is a way for us to, to process as we do that. We build up the ability to do it in real time. And, um, 
yet I think it's a really important, the, the, the terminology of that as it's being introduced into schools now is really social emotional learning, is how do we teach these skills of social emotional learning so that all young people, all people have this ability to connect with their emotions and other people. Well, certainly having that space is going to help and in finding different ways to encourage people to speak up for themselves, to ex express themselves. I was just on a coaching call this afternoon and it, it was obvious to me that the, the, the young man that I was working with, uh, one of the reasons he's, he's in the shape that he's in and how he feels about what's going on is he doesn't have anyone else around anyone around him to to express it to, and and he's like, well, I, he's like, but I'm fine, and I was like, well, you wanted to have this call because you wanted to talk these issues out, so obviously you don't have anyone that you feel this open with, so you had to book this call with me, and that's fine, but what are you doing outside of this call so that you can express yourself to the people around you so that you can build stronger connections i'm just your coach on the other side of this on the country and i'm happy to have this call but for your sanity and health you're going to need to have people around you where you feel safe to do this as well and we are certainly seeing fewer and fewer of those places available for for young men and young women i think it was also more intrinsic to how we were living before the technology when you're a young man playing with friends you're expressing yourself all, all the time you're building clubs you're uh, building tree houses you're making things up you're using your imagination this was all in itself self-expression and you did it around other young kids and you expressed yourselves together to build these imaginary worlds in which you played in well i think a, a big part of it that we're seeing and, and the my experience that I had in joining the group was that we've dumbed down emotions to emojis and we <laughs> use so few words to express emotions. And I, I, I guess part of it's silly, but part of it's really true. And a lot of us, when we talk about our emotions, we're not painting with color. We're, we're just like penciling them in and moving on to the next thing. And, and what my experience with the men's group has really been in the holding of that space is, is going deeper and deeper into the emotion and the layers and, and really unpacking it. So it's not just anger. There's more to it. It's more mm -hmm. nuanced than that. But as men, we compartmentalize, we put a label on it and go, I don't have to deal with this emotion on to the next thing. And unfortunately that builds up and can have some really messy repercussions as, we, as we've talked about with some of our other guests. But I think as we look at emotions and their impact on our lives, we need to start speaking more openly about them, but going deeper into them and expressing what that physical sensation is, but then also what is that mental feeling that you're feeling and, and not just letting it pass by as, oh, it's just anger, it's just sadness. It's a great point. And I think one of the things that I think about is, is anxiety is, like, is not knowing is so much of anxiety is, is not knowing, not knowing what the result is, what other people think of us, and we're focused on that not knowing. It's an anxious, unsettled feeling. And so when we don't spend any time with our emotions, you talk about dumbing it down to an emoji, when we don't have the words to articulate a feeling, we don't oftentimes sit in the not knowing, we just move on, right? It's like if someone says, we, we have a rule against this on our retreats, and it's because it's how often he's, you ask a guy how he's doing, how you doing? good. It's good. It's fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm good. And it's like, what's behind that? It's like, and that's a great word to go deeper. It's like, what's, what's behind that? And it's like, it's, you know, what's, what's behind the good? Why are you good? And it's that so often it's, it's such a reflexive, I don't want to actually dive into how I'm really feeling. So I'll just throw something quick to move past that. And it's so interesting. One of the things that we often talk about, uh, you know, and you've experienced probably in group is the idea of just slowing down. And when people use the words, I don't know, which comes up a lot. It's like, what's behind that? How long has it been there? I don't know. Anytime says, someone says, I don't know, the next thing that oftentimes happens is they move on really quickly to the next thought into some sort of thought that they've already processed in their mind that they've probably spoken before. But what's really interesting is the I don't know. 
what's the thing that you don't know? And can we exist in the I don't know and the exploration of what's there? What does it feel like to not know? And being in that, like we talked about again, it's just increasing our capacity. It's, it's providing us with a lexicon to, when we feel these things, speak to them. Not even, you know, if that's with somebody else, but even in our mind so that we can understand them, we can learn from them, we can integrate them consciously into our communication and learn a lot about where we're at, what we need in our lives. And what I found is it's cathartic, certainly at the end of the meeting, because part of it is sharing it with a group of men that are also going through similar things. So you you not only hear your own emotions, but a lot of times you hear a lot of other emotions you haven't fully unpacked mirrored back at you by their responses. And on top of that, I, I've found that it's made me more expressive outside of that space. So as you were saying, it's really grown my emotional vocabulary. It's made me more conscious of the way I express emotions to other people so that I'm not just compartmentalizing as, oh, I'm just sad. And it's made me a better listener to other people's emotions. So I highly encourage those of you who are listening, who are interested in doing deeper work, seeking out a group, a men's group. I know there are women's groups as well. I create a safe space for you to communicate about your emotions because uh, certainly a lot of us are struggling with a depth of emotions that we probably haven't dealt with ever in our lives. Yeah, I'll, I'll say one one thing on that because I think it's it's one of the reasons that I, I love men's work is that when when we create a space where like the goal is to just be real to express ourselves what is so powerful is that oftentimes we experience our emotions as a burden for other people to experience our emotions to share them with other people if it's not joy or excitement or happiness we experience them as a burden and we don't want to share them with other people but what oftentimes happens in men's groups, on retreats, and spa like spaces like this, is that when you share your experience, you are creating space for other people to go there, to, to deal with the thing, to dig up the thing that, that they didn't have the capacity to deal with, to interact with, to engage on their own. It's about authenticity and caring about other people's space to be authentic as well. Because if you're just going around being like, this is how I feel, this is what I want, this is narcissism. But if you go into, I want to speak my truth so that other people can do the same and be interested in that, then being authentic, being honest connects you to a deeper purpose of creating space for other people to just be real with whatever they're experiencing as well. It's a powerful frame to, I think, transform how we show up with people. All right. This is a Q&A episode, so let's unpack the mailbag here. We have our first questions from Daniel. I've recently switched employers, and in the company I'm working for now, I'm leading a team of eight programmers. After being in that job for about a month now, I'm beginning to realize that there really is very little team spirit. Don't get me wrong, everyone's doing their job and we're getting things done, but no more than that either. Maybe I'm asking too much, but I was hoping to be leading a team that would be as motivated and as pumped to go to work each day as I was in my previous job. Do you have any tips for me here, Vast Daniel? Totally. I feel like this is right up tributes alley. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, you know, again, I think that I think about it as the context for creativity, the context for communication is that if you can create the space, or it's a beautiful, it's the idea that we can create the space that people show up in. And so, if we create a container with prompts or invitations to say, I would ask you know, this guy who wrote this question, and we're like, what is it that you desire? So he wants more spirit, he wants more excitement, more connection, it sounds like it works, so there's his purpose for doing it. But I think what's also important is curiosity. Like, what do you wanna know about these people? Is I think that a great way to start that conversation is just to acknowledge that of like owning his own experience. It's like, hey guys, I noticed that, you know, I'd love to feel like more connected and engaged like outside of just talking about work stuff, and I'm curious, if anyone else has been feeling a similar desire. So it's owning like, what is it that I desire? Cool, there you go. Curious, has anyone else been experiencing that? And then you see, you know, from them, like, have they been feeling that? And then it's the idea of, so what do I actually wanna do? And w one of the simplest things I do, and we've done this for hundreds of companies now, is the idea of we have in our Slack, like the gratitude channel, which is like people come in and every Friday and on Monday they come in and it's like everyone shares their gratitude. And it just connects people to one thing that they're grateful for, one thing that they're looking forward to, one person they're grateful for. And what it does is it's basically, we don't even set like a, a mandatory thing there, but it's just, if you want to do it, do it. And a lot of, most people do. 
and it just kind of like creates this space for a new conversation within the company that's not directly related to our work. And so that's a context, right? Where like, look, now companies, like now our employees can talk about gratitude. And if there's another area of interest, it's whether that's in like a physical meetup space, that's basically, hey, like we're gonna go and every other week we're gonna do two hours to do book club. It's like a chance to have a more intentional space. It's that depending on what he wants, it's that he can, again, you talked about this earlier of, being a leader for the type of communication and engagement that you want. It's like, that's the powerful thing is that we can't wait for other people to do it, whether that's expressing gratitude, whether that's having deeper, more meaningful conversations, it's up to us to create that space. And so it's, what's my desire to use anyone share that with me? And then what are the practical spaces that I can create that make it easier for people to get excited, to have deeper conversations? I completely agree with that idea of we have to take the lead on this. We can't expect other people to just jump up with team spirit. And we had Patrick Lencioni on earlier this year, and he said that the same thing, that we have to be intentional with our communication and realize that the more we invest in our team's lives outside of work, so what's going on with their family, what their hopes and dreams are, what they're in looking forward to, that creates the space for the team spirit that you're looking for. And a lot of us go about it the wrong way. We try to lead by just pepping up the energy and being more emotional and trying to be more celebratory. And for a lot of people, if something's going on at home, they're not going to have that team spirit. That is going to be the far bigger distraction. So getting to understand them at a deeper level that maybe they're not feeling team spirit right now because well, they're not dealing with this crisis properly. They're struggling at work from home because now they're homeschooling. That is going to create the space as a leader where the team feels more invested because you have their back. You care more than just about the task at hand or the role that they have. You care about them as a person. Yeah, it's beautifully said. And I think that it's indicative of true leadership to zoom out of the, the momentary rush and busyness that is such a, a part of so many workplaces to say it's like if i invest in knowing these people and supporting them as people our company is going to be stronger jessica asked for tips on how to improve interactions in her video conferences hey i could use your advice when it comes to video conferencing i've changed into home office and so has the rest of the team i used to enjoy our team meetings or meetings with a client when they happened in real life I feel like social time where we were together and also bond a little is now gone. Now that this happens in a video conference, my meetings have become a pain for more reasons than I dare to list here, but just to name my biggest grievances, uh, apparently it's a long list. People seem constantly busy and something else is on their mind when they're not talking or they're distracted. We keep speaking over each other and never know when it's safe to say something without talking over someone, usually my boss, and I also feel like I'm the only one who cares to dress in work clothes, and that alone makes my own morale drop. I could go on, but you get the picture. Any general advice on what I could do to make these meetings a little more fun again? And any tips on how I can pass these on to my boss, or, or maybe this isn't my job to fix, but it, it looks like I might have to. Thank you, Jessica. When I lock onto a Zoom call, I have every single guy pick up their phone, and I have them put it on at least silent mode and airplane mode if they can. You know, so it's, we have this ritual where everyone hops on and it's like, all right, phones up, everyone puts them on. And then together we put them on silent mode or we put them on airplane mode. And then I have everyone go to the full screen, which is like two simple things to make them more effective. But it's like, we're all going to be on full screen. We're going to be fully here. And then we're going to be on airplane mode if we can be. And so just that intentionally, that reminder of like, we're just going to give each other our presence. And that's what I say every time is like, we're going to give each other the gift of our presence for an hour. You know, and that, that sort of declaration or invitation is a better word. I think that anytime that you tell people like, I want you to do this, you're going to be met with some resistance, but I, I love the idea of an invitation. It's like, I'm just going to invite people. I'm going to do this and I'd love to invite people to do it so that we can be more present, more connected, more productive together would be a few things you could do. I love all those things. And for the last two questions, I thought you've answered them perfectly and there's really nothing that I can add to them. However, I want to take a different approach to a, a two things that I, that I see that could be an issue that haven't been brought up. I want to make sure we lay them on the table. Yeah. I, I was going to 
going to talk a little bit about the flip side too. So Yeah. So I have certainly been in plenty of meetings in the last 15 years of being an entrepreneur where where meetings aren't fun. And the reason meetings aren't fun is we continue to have the same meeting over and over again and we are spinning our wheels in a certain area and because we're spinning our wheels, we're having the same meeting over and over again. It's dragging everybody down. And when, and that happens, it happens a lot, at least. And it certainly happens where we're expecting people to, to begin to move forward. And, and I, and I want to say that if you feel like you're having the same meetings over again, then something has to change. And either the the will that is spinning, that is not improving, that is not learning, they either have to get removed or you're going to continue to grind down your team and everyone else who is coming into those meetings really excited, who are coming into those meetings uh, fired up and want to take on the day. But then that one meeting takes the wind out of their sails and now they're brought down and for the rest of the day, they are stewing on, did we really just have 45 minutes of the same meeting we had last week, of the same meeting we had the week before, and the same meeting we had before that? And how quickly those can degenerate into a lot of hostility and a lot of anger. And being that if you see that happening, you have to be willing to snip it quickly because they have a way of, of just infecting everything. One of the simplest little tweaks here is that if you can tell people that we have, if you have an hour for a meeting and you tell people, and I want to get you out of here in 45, it's one of the simplest things that I've just noticed. It's like oftentimes even in keynotes, what I'll say is like, I'm supposed to be talking for 45 minutes today. I'm going to finish in 30. And if you guys want to ask questions, you can do that. You know, it's immediately, it, it feels like you are showing a reverence for their time. Anytime I send an email to someone new, I'm like, I'm sure you're probably really busy. And I appreciate any time you can take to be here. Anytime you show reverence for people's time ahead of time, they're going to immediately feel more connected and more present. So it's just, I know you guys are busy. We've got this much time. We're going to try and have you out of here a little bit early. It's here are the things that I want to cover. How do we feel about that? And getting by in there. So it's shared purpose, honoring people's time up front to super simple things that you can do to improve meetings. I just, I want to add- add to that, that if you enjoy what you're doing and you enjoy where you work, you're a good fit culture wise, then you should be really enjoying meetings and you should be fired up. And if you're not, there is something wrong and you have to figure out what that is. If the meetings are too long, then they're too long. If somebody is poisoning the well, then somebody is poisoning the well. But if you're, if it's a good fit, and you and you're love what you're doing, meetings should be rad. Meetings should be a place of getting semblance and hearing where everyone's at and getting fired up. As we talked about, being a leader is paying attention to not just the KPIs and the numbers and the context, but it's also paying attention to the emotions of the team. And, and in her response, like people seem constantly busy with something else. Well, checking in outside of the meeting. What, what is that thing? Maybe it's their kids. Maybe they're struggling and you just taking a minute to invest in them will allow them to feel a little bit better. A lot of us feel unheard right now in these video conferences because we don't really have time to talk. Everyone's just got to get their thing in and then get back to work. And of course, in those situations, being the leader, wearing the work clothes, showing up to the meeting a little early and chit-chatting with people before the meeting starts. I mean, these are all opportunities for you to be that rock for someone else who is struggling in this crisis, remembering that it's not easy for everybody. I love that. All right. Last one for today. Serena asks, I'm 23 and I moved to New York City right out of college to start my career in banking. Because of the virus, I've been forced to move back home with my family until it's safe for me to move back to New York. You've spoken about how to deal with toxic relationships, particularly family members in the past, and I'm sure others might be experiencing having to move back with their loved ones at this time. So I'm wondering how to bring all of these new skills I'm excited about to some of the most toxic relationships in my life to make them stronger. I love my family more than anything, but after time away from them, I've realized that they were the cause of a lot of the underlying issues in my life. 
I want to look back at this quarantine being proud of the relationships I've strengthened rather than feeling regret for simply trying to avoid these toxic moments. I'd love to hear your thoughts or any suggestions you might have on how to handle relationships like this when conversations only lead to arguments and more resentment. So grateful for you guys. Thank you for sharing your knowledge. What, I, what I'd say is that it takes two people to get into an argument, right? It's like, so the idea of an argument is back and forth and it's natural to be what Ram Dass said. You think you're enlightened, go spend a weekend with your family, right? And so <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of accelerated uh, personal transformation that is happening right now for people that are, are with their parents and their spouses here, certainly. So you know, I, I think, again, how we can address these things. I love the idea of just challenging conversations. And there's a theme emerging here, but is with our parents and with anybody, again, realizing that I have control over my motivators and my own actions and not how other people respond. And so we had talked about social flow before, but the importance of that in situations where we are oftentimes uh, triggered or impacted uh, is even more powerful because going into places where you can often get triggered by external motivators, it's so important to be present to how do I want to show up here? Because if you're going into a conversation with your parents, you don't want to show up like, I don't want to show up like an asshole. I don't want to show up, you know, super sad. It's like, I want to show up present. I want to be curious, whatever those are. So if we come back to intentionality, curiosity, what do I want to know about my parents? And we challenged a bunch of our, our guys actually through this time, the exercise of, I think one of the things that I, I often see with uh, children, adult children and their parents, they have this desire to be seen and understood and accepted by their parents, right? It's like, do you, do you guys have that? I know I do, especially, you know, it's like to be seen, supported, accepted. And then I, I ask my guys and I say, do you know your parents really? Do you know what they need? Do you know what their dreams are? Do you know like what they care about right now? And almost always, like we don't because we, we know our parents so well from our childhood at this level that was just automatic. We didn't necessarily have to try because we were just around them. But the idea of, I think that this, this time frame, right, where we have this time, so many of us are, whether we're with our parents in our house, whether we're far away, that one of the most powerful things we can do to transform our relationship with parents is to increase our level of understanding about who they are, to humanize them versus responding to how they've impacted us of like who is this person right what's their their motivation like the thing behind them and so before we we seek the acceptance the support that seeing how can i give that right and i think so much of that is like the questions what questions don't you know about your parents about like what upsets them about how I'm acting of like, what do they want? What's been challenging for them lately? How can I support them? And so I think that one of the simplest things we could do again is say like, you know, I'd love to invite in a deeper level of connection. I'd like to invite in a deeper level of, of calm. Curious if you've been feeling the same way. Just setting aside time to get to know your parents on a deeper level, to understand them. And when I say, when you do that exercise of asking questions, don't, don't expect anything but the answers that they're capable of giving for where they're at is that you're not there to critique them, you're not there to challenge what they say, you're there to ask questions and to let them respond at whatever level and however honestly they're capable of doing. And doing that is a really powerful way to create space for them to, to just tell their story. And it, it's, you know, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be real for a moment. It's like, for those of you who still have your parents around, we were talking about asking these questions and, and there was a man who was there who didn't get to ask these questions to his dad. And there was a lot of stuff that he was aware of that he never got to ask. And if you have things that you don't know about your parents, humanize your, your parents are humans. They have experienced traumas. They have experienced challenges. They have dreams. It's like get to know them as people. And when we understand them as humans, it becomes so much easier to relate to them as people, to have empathy, to have compassion, to move forward. So I would say that that's, uh, that's one thing that we can do there. I wrote a whole post about how to have that conversation because it's a big one. Well, we talk a lot about stronger frame dissolves the weaker one. Parents, family, they know our triggers and our buttons better than anyone. What they're not expecting is for us to be open to that feedback, appreciative of that feedback, to say, I really appreciate you caring so deeply about me and expressing that opinion and that point of view. It means the world to me. It makes me feel that I'm loved. Wow. Okay. Is that going to start an argument? 
for many of us, what we're doing is we're we're putting up a wall to deflect their emotions and and their care about us, and we're going in the logical route of picking apart each other's arguments. And what you said that was so powerful is creating space to learn about your parents and ask them, when is the last time in your life you were this scared or uncertain? When was the last time you were super excited my age? And what was it that you were excited about when you were my age? And really putting yourself more on their journey deflects them from focusing on your journey. It's really powerful because we love to talk about ourselves. And if you could focus more on your parents' journey and their experiences, they're going to share and you're going to learn some things that you probably didn't know. You'll create depth in that relationship and expressing appreciation that they care so much about you and they have these high views of you and they hold you in such high regard and they have these expectations will often remove that conflict that you're feeling of having to prove your point to them or win that argument that leads to a lot of this toxic relationship behavior that we've talked about in other episodes. How much appreciation and love for your parents do you have inside of you that you have never expressed to them? Things that they did, the ways that they've impacted you. It's like, for those of us who have parents whom we're grateful for any reason, it's one of our, one of our cornerstone sayings is if you, you grew up with this statement that says, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it at all. And if you remove the don'ts from that statement, it becomes, if you have anything nice to say, say it all. And it's like, you know, we, we, we hold on to that stuff because we feel that it, it can make us weak if they don't reciprocate, whatever that is. But if you have appreciation in you for your parents, especially, it's letting that out, letting them know that, helping them to feel like they have had a positive impact that they had. Andrew, where can our audience find out more about your great podcast and set up their own tribute? Because as we talked about to start the show, there's so many amazing use cases right now. And I'm so proud that you have opened it up for free for all of these people to connect when we are isolating. Yeah. So you can definitely go to, uh, you want to go to the special page, which is tribute.co forward slash Corona. And so that's where you'll get the, the $25 off to create your, your free tribute. And so I'd highly encourage you to experience that right now, whether it's, you know, someone who's graduating, someone canceled a wedding. Um, you've got a birthday that, that somebody's missing. Uh, it's a powerful experience, transforms the, the framework and, and the foundation in which you're connecting with your friends. And then um, you can catch any of my own stuff, writing, speaking, and gratitude and social flow and all that stuff at itsandrewhorn.com. And my podcast is on there called What's the Big Idea, which is kind of like a conversational TED Talk where we, we take amazing people in and get to hear their stories and big idea they wish more people could integrate into their lives. And um, the men's work that, that AJ and I had talked about is all through our platform called We Junto, where we do monthly men's retreats. And then we also have these uh, completely free donation-based uh, virtual men's groups that anyone can tap into. So no prior experience is, uh, is required, just a curiosity and a desire to, to go deep and get real and connect with, uh, with good men. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, fellas.